Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello again, Dyke Drummond here from our home in beautiful Seattle, Washington, the home base of thehappymd.com. And this is the latest Physicians on Purpose podcast. And today you're in for a, a, a real treat because we're going to have a battle of the <laughs> battle of the <laughs> opinions about moral injury and burnout and what what they are. Are they the same thing? Are they different things? What's what's language that we can use to understand it? And my guest today is Dr. Jenny Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, Dr. Jenny Byrne, who is a psychiatrist and a neurophysiologist. Follow her on LinkedIn, and she's here because she's writing a book about moral injury. Book number two. What was book number one about, Dr. Byrne? It was called Work Smart, Use Your Brain and Behavior to Master the Future of Work, oh which is a long, long title to basically understand virtual hybrid work and how you can optimize it using an understanding of our brain. Okay, cool. So can you give us like one take home tip? The one thing we might want to learn about how to master our brain in a virtual setting, what would be one of those tips? Um, turn off the video. So oh, okay. what we're doing right now, we should stop doing, we should use video very selectively and we should be, um, being very thoughtful when we have video meetings with multiple people about how to structure that. So our brain doesn't feel like 10 lions are jumping out at us from the forest, which is like a foot away from our face. Cause that's exhausting to our brain. <laughs> Interesting. I remember when I started coaching back in 2000, all we had was the telephone. And over time, it became one of those skills where you could tell exactly what was going on on the other side through the energy on the telephone. Yep. And vid video is disorienting for me because of how often my client would double signal. They'd say one thing and their face would say something completely different. Okay, cool. That's right. So we both work with doctors and other healthcare professionals who are dealing with exhaustion, overwhelm, burnout, and other stressors in the workplace. And one of the ones that's become a common term in our world, and you may hear it from me first, dear listener, right now, is one called moral injury. And there are some people that say that there is no such thing as burnout. It's all moral injury. So let's do dueling definitions of moral injury. How would you describe <laughs> moral injury, Dr. Byrne? So the definition I'm using comes from the veterans, it says from the VA, and it says three things. One, you do something or part of something or witness something that goes against your values. Two, that it is ordered or condoned by your superior. And three, that the stakes are high. So that's the official definition I'm using. Well, and the history of the term comes from actually documentation from war correspondents. Right. Who were filming battlefields like the, the young girl running away from the My Lai massacre, right? They were filming battlefield horrible experiences, but not helping the people who were experiencing them. And they came home so conflicted because they didn't right. do something. And so moral injury is also a situation where you as a doctor are in a position where you have a patient, you understand what's going on with the patient, you know what you want to do for that patient, but you can't. And so one of the one of the more high level moral injuries is a triage situation where there are no resources. Yeah. I have a person who needs a ventilator. The ventilators are all full. That person mistakes that either person is going to either get bagged forever or they're going to die. It mm -hmm. runs all the way down to I know what medicine I need my patient to be on, but their insurance won't cover it. Yeah. So it's from paper cuts to life threatening issues, and my position has always been burnout is an energy balance challenge. Burnout occurs when you take your energy balances in your physical, emotional, and spiritual energy accounts and drive them all into the negative. The defining feature of a doctor is you will continue to show up and try to do your work when your energy is below zero. The Energizer Bunny stops at zero. You don't. Mm -hmm. Any of your friends, if they had become doctors, the ones that didn't go to medical school, they'd call in sick on those days when their energy is negative. So moral injury is just one source of the stress that drains your energy accounts. And Dr. Byrne has a more expanded view of this. Yeah, so I think, and this is where we were having a nice little debate, but 
the language of burnout and energy to me comes from the industrialization of medicine. So what burns out? Light bulbs burn out, batteries burn out. So my point of view as a psychiatrist is that having the frame of moral injury as a human and thinking about moral injury as a wound that you can stage, is it a pressure room, you know, level one where it's kind of superficial or is it all the way level four down to your bone and that you have to heal the wound. You don't fix a wound, you heal the wound. And it's very different than the industrial language. So to me, using burnout to explain, I don't want to say everything, but using that as your predominant vernacular actually emphasizes the industrialization of what we're experiencing. When in fact, for many physicians and others, it feels more like a wound. And the healing of a wound is different than the fixing of a machine. So that's kind of my point of view. And as a psychiatrist, I have, you know, I don't know, I'm getting old, 20 years of experience treating psychiatry patients and psychotherapy that has led me to to think about wounds and healing as opposed to energy and fixing. So that's my point of view. Well, and there is no fix to burnout. It's not a problem. There's no solution. That has never been my philosophy. Mm -hmm. It is a dilemma. It's a balancing act. So what you do is you change your habits to reach a new balance, like a teeter-totter. You either yeah. decrease the amount you burn so for instance, we were talking earlier, AI is supposed to help with some of the busy work of documentation. Well, that would decrease yeah. the burn. And then I increase my ability to recharge, which are things that you typically do when you're not at work. Although you can recharge at work, it's just very rare. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you why I use the word burnout it has nothing to do with industrialization. The original researchers used the word burnout. Mm -hmm. There's a culturally accepted definition of burnout yeah. in the way that That's you true. Said. And mm -hmm. so I noticed when I was starting to do my coaching practice that gradually the academics were moving away from the term burnout. As a matter of fact, the people at the AMA and others started to use the word joy. And when I say the word joy, I cock my head like a dog that doesn't know what it's looking at because I've never in my life heard a doctor spontaneously use the word joy, ever. And so one time I was at a conference, Christina Maslach was there. Yeah. It was a conference where Tate Shannon felt and all the academics in the AMA and Christina yeah. Kaczynski were all there. And they were all using the word joy. And Christina Maslach stands up, the original researcher, lovely woman, great hugger. I gave her a crystal heart, which is what I give <laughs> all the people that bring me into work. That's right? nice. And um, I said to her, you know, these academics want to use the word joy. I notice you don't use the word joy. Why is that? And at the time, this was six or seven years ago, Dr. Maslach was still interviewing clients and still doing basic research yeah. and data collection. And she said, I use the word burnout because that's the word my subjects use. So when I say burnout and they say burnout, we know what we're talking about. See, I don't know. I think this is where our debate is. I think, so here's a good example. I interviewed um, a resident, someone who's in residency right now. And this is a very kind of high energy, cheerful, optimistic person. And they were talking to me about how they were considering leaving practicing medicine when they got out of residence. And I said, well, explain to me, I don't understand. And, and you seem like, you know, you're taking care of your mental health. You've got good energy. You're cheerful. You're up. Like, I don't understand why, why do you want to leave? And they said, something is just wrong. I just feel inside that something is wrong. I feel icky when I go to clinic and I take care of patients. I don't feel right. This isn't how I thought I would feel. I still love medicine. I still love my, you know, my chosen career, but I have energy, I'm sleeping, I, I, I'm not tired, but something is just wrong and I can't articulate what it is. And as again, maybe this is just my profession as a psychiatrist, people tell me all kinds of things. And a lot of, when I took care of physicians and other nurses and others, this is what would come into my office. And they'd say, something is just wrong. And it wasn't, they didn't need medicine. You know, they came to me oh, to get a pill. No. <laughs> no, they, they, they were having an existential crisis. And some of them, I'll tell you, you know, I, I'm putting this in the book. I've had people, you would never guess in a million years, they were considering suicide quite seriously. Young, energetic, top of their game, had mastered their craft on a path to success, accolades, research, like attractive, married, like the people that you look at and say, wow, they have their act together. These were the people that sat in my office and said, I'm thinking about killing myself. So 
I think our debate is, is I don't think that many physicians or others know sometimes what is wrong with them. They may say burnout, but that's kind of a catch-all for a bad feeling. So my premise and my point of view is that I like moral injury because it gives a different way to describe the negative feelings that people have, which can lead to really bad things. They can lead to just leaving medicine. They can lead to self-harm through alcohol. I hear a lot of that. They can lead to suicide. They can lead to divorces because you're fighting all the time with your significant other. They can lead to kids who hate you because you come home and you're just awful. So I think that's why for me, the word moral injury have a impact. They're, they're impactful words. They, they, they feel like something, right? They're, they're kind of harsh words. They, they make you feel like this wound. And so that's why I'm liking this term as a compliment to burnout, which I think you're right. And it's not just in healthcare that people are burned out in the modern world. To me, that's a little bit more of a generic term and, and specific for physicians and clinicians. The moral injury is, is what really needs to get healed. And so in my work, we use the word burnout a lot mm -hmm. because that's the point where my client has reached a teachable moment. You're, you're meeting them where they are and using their language, which is all psychologically it's, it's, very it's, sound. But I'm meeting them because they've reached out. And right. in order for a doctor to reach out to somebody who positions themselves as a helper when you're in distress and don't like your career, you yeah. have to have stepped through a whole bunch of internal psychological barriers. That's true. And so that's true. When I first meet someone, I ask them, how'd you hear about me? Right. Where did you find mm -hmm. me? Because I want to know where they found me on the Internet. But the next thing I say is, hey. I know there's a bunch of crap going on that really feels uncomfortable. I know that. That's why you're connecting with me. Yeah. And I do want to hear about that. I just don't want to hear about that first. Because what you're yeah. going to tell me is all the things that aren't working. And we as doctors are specialists in figuring out what's not working. Symptoms. You start symptoms. positive. That's what yeah. we do. So what I say is, and I do, if you're watching me on YouTube, you'll watch this. I say, yeah, because you can avoid everything you don't want. And you know what? You still won't get what you want. Because there's yeah. only one way to get what you want, and that's figure out what, what is. you want and go get it. Now, these two things are related, but they're not the same. I so agree. Tell me, and this is the I'm 95% uh, of the people when I ask them this question, I'm the first person in their life who's ever asked them this, even if they're 50. Wow. Tell me your ideal practice. And usually I get a goldfish open mouth. And I say, yep. hang on a second, let me give you some cues. So in an <laughs> ideal, if in an ideal world, if you had a magic yeah. wand. If you were yeah. the king of the forest, if you could design yeah. your own perfect job just for you, what kind of patients would you be seeing doing what kinds of stuff for what kind of hours and what kind of pay on what kind of team and what kind of organization where in the world? And I say, if you don't know, that's okay. Most people don't. Yep. And this takes a while to wake up. But going forward, the way out of your current predicament is to get some clarity. And I'm here to help you with that. That's always the first step. Coaches always mm -hmm. coach the client on what is it that you really want? Because nobody comes knowing what they want. They just know they don't right. want this. Yeah, right. So then we get really clear on what it is that you want. And we create a plan, new actions, getting new results, turning mm -hmm. them into habits that gradually give them a sense of agency that they can actually modify what they're thinking and feeling. And B, get a, get a sense of, I have the ability to affect my results. I do have some control. I do have some ability to find the wiggle yeah. room, the wiggle yeah. room inside my job description to feel better. Mm -hmm. So burnout is not something that we even mention. Yeah. After the, like the original sentence. Yeah. And I actually, I have a confession to make. My work has nothing to do with burnout. It's just the point where we meet. <laughs> it's the entry point. Well, and maybe another way to think about it is like when you get someone as a coach, like you said, they've been primed. They're already at, if we would use the language of psychiatry again, or psychology, they're ready. They're high readiness by the time they're already taking action to reach out to you. And like you said, there's a million steps to get to that. And maybe what I'm trying to speak to is the physician or the other who is suffering in silence has no idea they're not ready to take action they're not they're kind of pre-contemplation like they don't even know what's wrong they're just feeling terrible their life has gone down the tube and giving them a framework to or, or giving their boss a framework to talk to them 
because they've noticed they're showing up looking like garbage. You know, I think maybe I'm speaking to people who aren't quite as far along on the readiness to take action as maybe the folks that come to see you. So that might be part of the language is, you know, for the for the folks suffering in silence who really have no idea what's going on and have no one to talk to and not ready to take action. If I can put my book in the world and and people start talking about it, maybe that gives voice to for, for that kind of person, you know. And the challenge, as we were discussing earlier, is it's one thing to recognize moral injury. Yeah. And that's important. It's one thing to tell your story to a willing listener about your own personal episode of right. moral injury and to be witnessed and seen and heard and empathized with. But the question is, how do you heal a wound when it happened in the workplace on purpose right. as a deliberate policy of the organization that is your employer? <laughs> right. Well, and you know, I've been interviewing, I think I've done 30 interviews so far for the book, and these are clinicians I don't actually know personally at all. I've, I've reached out to them to interview, and there's a common thread I'm getting now a couple weeks later where they're reaching back out and saying, you know, it was really healing just to talk to you. I think you're the first person that I really told that story to, and you know, that actually really made me feel better. And so sometimes, again, this comes from psychiatry. Sometimes just talking about it and telling someone else who, like you said, is empathetic and a kind, active listener, there is healing sometimes just in that part. Now, it's not going to heal a stage four down to the bone injury just to tell your story, but there is healing in words. And again, that's my clinical bias just because that's what I've practiced for decades of medicine and seeing the power of words. You know, psychiatry, we don't have intervention we don't have a ton of interventions we don't have a ton of medicines you know we don't have a ton of science it's a lot of art and a lot of words and and i've seen the power of words i'm a convert i was a basic scientist by training i didn't believe in talk therapy until i did it myself and then i was a convert after that um so i i do believe in the power of words yes the the rest of it matters a lot but the first step is to have the words and to have someone hear you right yeah, and the big challenge that I see is that the vast majority of workplaces are hostile environments that yes. nat naturally and automatically morally wound yeah. everybody in the system every day. And what ends up happening is the trust level is so low at work that they'll mm -hmm. never, if somebody recognizes their own moral injury and wants a sympathetic ear, they'll never find it at work and they'll never disclose to a colleague because they don't want to violate the second prime directive of healthcare, which is never show weak. Mm -hmm. So for them to come offline to me, offline to you outside the workplace, be seen, yeah. heard, and empathized with is one level of healing. But the yeah. question is, are we perhaps enabling them to walk back into a toxic environment? Right, right. And I, and I, I don't want to minimize what needs to happen at the systems level, because that's, that's a big part of of it but again if you manage anyone if you're on a team you can provide a space for someone to tell you their story and there are communities like your community i've talked to some others who have online communities where physicians and others are supporting one another so you can even if that work environment is toxic maybe you have to leave eventually honestly right but i've interviewed some other folks and they said you know what one day i woke up and realized they told me I was going to see 20 patients a day. And I just said, no, I'm not. And they said, fire me. I don't care about our views. I don't care about bonuses. I make enough money. Go ahead, fire me. And they didn't. They just said no. And they were like shocked because they just stopped seeing 20 patients a day. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that we, we have a lot of power. We don't know. And we have a lot of choices we don't know because to get through medical school and residency and all that, like, you have to be a people pleaser and you have to be somebody who just is stoic sometimes and you just put your head down and do the work. So we're kind of already like that naturally. Um, but we do have power, right? I mean, maybe it's different if you work in a hospital because if you can only work in a hospital, you have to find one hospital that's not toxic. <laughs> I do think there are some that aren't, but it is hard to find sometimes. Well, and we teach whole frameworks and checklists of actions to cultivate a relationship of influence with somebody either lateral yeah. to you or up yeah. the chain of command. And that would put you in a situation of being able to have yeah. these discussions 
Right. But certainly, I wouldn't want anybody to leave here today and say, "Hey, I was listening to the Dyke Drummond on that podcast, and they told me to tell my boss, no, I won't see him. I won't see." Tony <laughs> so don't do no. that. Don't do that because <laughs> right, if you do that without any attempt to build a relationship first, what's going to happen is you're going to yes. get labeled. If you're a man, it's disruptive. If you're a woman, it's the B word, and they're going to yes. be number one on the fire list. Yes, I, so I agree, I and I should recommend it. No, no, I'm not. I certainly am not recommending that. I think I'm using that as an example, but. I guess oh, you have I, power. You have power. You can walk. You can leave. You can step yes. out. You don't have to go into work today. But the challenge is this, and employers play on this all the time. Yes. What comes up for you internally right now in terms of emotions and feelings when I say, just don't even go into work tomorrow? What are you thinking? Well, what about my Well, that's against, well, what about that's my against your values. And, right? And, and, that's and, your values. And the whole way that organizations, organizations can short staff you and shine you on when you're because three partners down and four MAs down and these, they just don't seem to be able to hire them, is you know what? If you're seeing the same number of patients with two less docs and four less MAs, you're making a whole hell of a lot more money. So the financial disincentive to staff appropriately is relying on your ethics and morals to feel guilt and shame for not showing up and doing right. it. Right, they're playing on your, your so values, but incredible. they're making you do something then which goes against your values by right. providing lesser quality of care. It's evil, and it happens all the time everywhere. Well, I'm so excited that you're doing this work, and I met others like you who are providing different kinds of solutions, um, because when someone is ready to make a change, they need a trusted person or group to reach out to. And I think I'm hoping that maybe writing this book can, can again, reach out to folks who aren't ready or who aren't thinking in these terms and get them ready. And then maybe they have resources like what you do and others that they can take advantage of. Yeah, increase the inline, incline sliding towards the teachable moment. And I wanna- Yeah, just, get them ready. <laughs> and and I, just, I just wanna make a point of clarification. Burnout is not a problem. There is no solution. So I don't offer solutions. What I offer is clarity on what you really want yeah. And the ability to build a strategy to change your energy balance to yeah. a positive level and develop agency, being able to influence the organization to find you some wiggle room so that you can actually fit your practice into your job description. And if you can't, a way to get the heck out of there. Because you know what? And really... even just that process is healing. Just oh, the yeah. process of what you do is part of the healing of the wound, right? Giving right. that feeling of autonomy and agency. That is a huge part of healing those wounds. And it's interesting, in our work, we've discovered that there's actually seven skill sets that you didn't learn in medical school or residency. A full seven of them, we teach all of them, but seven of them that you are mm -hmm. absolutely required for a resident to yeah. actually create a life around the choice to become a doctor. Oh, I like that one. I got to look at that one. Well, closer. that's the difference between residency and yeah, and out in practice. Burnout in residency is completely yeah. different than burnout out in practice. Yeah. Because burnout in residency is a bounded task. There's a beginning yeah. and there's the end. Right. It's a survival contest. The only thing you want to do as a resident is get done. finish. Yeah. And you don't have to be in one piece when you get to the finish line. You can be missing one eye and three fingers off your left hand, but nobody cares. Because what do they call the person who graduates last from their medical school class? Doctor. Doctor. That's right. Out in practice. Yeah. That's when you have to take this single-minded absence yeah. of a life dedication to your career and actually build a life around it. Now, the healthiest people that I've seen, it's interesting, are the folks that have to build a life while their residents are medical students. They have oh, babies. interesting. They had babies in medical school or residency. Well, I had a baby in residency, so maybe... Ah, uh, you're already broken. <laughs> you know how to have two points of influence, right? So, so for instance, interesting yeah. in a leadership audience. When I have a whole bunch yeah. of leaders in an organization, I will ask this question. I asked it once years ago, and I huh. ask it every time now, because what's a physician leader? Somebody who's both a clinician and an administrator. It's two priorities. Yeah. yeah. So I, I say, raise your hand if you had children in med school or residency, and in every leadership class I've ever led at least a third of the hands go up. Really? Because they had huh. that priority of a child at the time that yeah. they were going through their, and I think that that gives some people an interesting balancing skill set. So women should be really good at that. Exactly. <laughs> Except the good, old, the good old boys club doesn't honor them. Well, no, and then when the fashion. women, what I noticed for women, that's a whole other conversation about for women, the higher up the food chain you get is when you really get slammed. 
I didn't feel any of that until I got up to the, you know, VP, SVP, whatever. And then I got slammed hard. Up until then, I I was like, well, oh, it's the same thing. I don't feel being a woman makes me any different. But then when I felt it, it was really rough. So the well, higher up you go, you really feel it. And the big demographic challenge that's coming is that now 53.5% of med school applicants and yeah. people in med school are women. But in the first seven years of their practice after residency graduation, 40% of them will go part-time or quit. Yeah, so they're I know. Coming, they're coming through and quitting. Yeah, right at the beginning. That's what I was saying earlier. Like, you know, the residents, they're already ready to quit. I mean, so that's why I'm saying it's not just energy, like young, very energetic residents are ready to quit, right? So there's something going on there. Well, and what I say is that burnout is here. To put yeah. you, to make you uncomfortable enough that you change what you do to put you on a path with more purpose. I like that. One of the experience, experiments that I ask people to engage in is a conversation. So check this out and maybe consider doing it, dear listener. Okay. Okay. Think of someone who's older than you that you look up to as somebody where you look at them. They're a doctor too, right? And you look at them and you say, wow, I hope I'm half as cool as they are when I'm their age. Somebody like that. Yeah. Yeah. So buy, buy him a cup of coffee and sit down and say, hey, tell, yeah. me your, tell me your burnout story. Interesting. And the cooler you think they are, the more likely they are to say this in response. Yeah. Which one? Interesting. Because burnout marks this. There was a point in time in your life where you were doing what everybody expected of, them, of you, yeah. coloring it inside the lines, following orders, and it got so uncomfortable that you couldn't continue. And you made a big change, a, an arc in your career. Somehow huh. made a change. And that change has made all the difference. Thank God you're not still back there. That's burnout. And the change that it drove huh. you into yeah. is its highest and best use. Interesting. And in our conversation, there are situations in which a single episode of moral injury can drive you off yeah. that track and in straight into a career and a life change like that. Excellent. Well, this has been such a great conversation. I'm so glad that we got to chat. I particularly love being able to debate different points of view on the topic because we're both passionate about it and we both care deeply and um, really happy to be able to, to talk with you. Yeah, and one of the things that we specialize here at the Happy MD is making things practical. I'm a coach. Mm -hmm. And so we're, our job is to help make things simpler to understand, simpler to learn, implement, immediately giving you the benefits that you seek. So all of yeah. our tools are honed in that way. So how should people get a hold of you, Dr. Byrne? B Y R N E yeah, so, Burn. <laughs> yeah, B Y R N E. Um, I think following me on LinkedIn is where I'm most active in terms of writing. Um, my first book, Work Smart, is on Amazon. My second book, um, I don't know the title yet, probably something with moral injury in it. That will be out probably in May. Um, and I do have a, a small practice that I'm uh, developing to take care of physicians who need more, who need more mental health, um, as opposed to a coaching approach. So I guess stay tuned for that. I'll be talking about that on LinkedIn when it gets up and off the ground. You don't have a website for that one right now? It's being built. Okay, it's gotcha. going to be called Constellation, but it's being built. So sorry, I can't share it quite yet. Gotcha. Stay so tuned. And we will have, wherever you're watching this or listening to this, we will have Dr. Burns' LinkedIn link and her first book link on Amazon. Yeah, it's an audio book, uh, Kindle and paperback hardback. So whatever format you like. Great. We'll have that in the show notes. Anything else awesome. you want to tell our listeners? No, I think, again, if people are listening, maybe who aren't quite ready to make a change, they're not quite ready for that active next step. You know, that's okay. You know, you can be pre-contemplation, contemplation, people bounce back and forth. You might be ready to make a change, and then you kind of slip back into that doldrum where you don't want to make a change. Again, that is all totally normal. If you've never worked with a psychiatrist or a therapist before, you know, we will tell you that is totally normal. Just keep keep trying to gain that self-awareness and and keep listening to things like this, keep reading, keep learning. And then when you're ready for that change, you know, there are folks out there who are really passionate about this, who really want to help you. And it can, it can be done. We can help heal you and, and, and help you. So when you're ready, if you're not ready yet, like it's okay, but we're here for you when you're ready. And my, my uh, exhortation would be, and listen to the desire for change. Don't stuff it. There's nothing yeah. wrong with you. Agree. There's nothing wrong with you. Agree. That desire for change is real. If you want it, 
You probably deserve it. You don't have to earn it. And there are, ways, there are ways for you to get what you want out of your career, even if they're not clear to you right now. Right Definitely on, agree. So, Dr. Jenny Byrne, BYRNE, and Dyke Drummond here on the latest Physicians on Purpose podcast. Until we see you in the next podcast, keep breathing. Have a great rest of your day.